while the museum sector itself is discussing quite intensely what's happening to us, with us, and what we are um, planning to do. Um, there is probably less of a um, discussion between us and the wider society about that, and maybe even between us and actually the political establishment about what actually um, happens in the museum sector and in the cultural sector these days. And my hope is um, that tonight we will actually <coughs> come to a slightly wider discussion that actually goes outside our little circles where we all know the same things and share similar opinions and um, <coughs> try to think more creatively about what the future of museums in the country might be like. And for this we um, <coughs> found a wonderful panel and I'm very um, grateful to Piermetta Rocco that she has um, actually agreed to chair this discussion today. Um, she is the <coughs> books and art editor of The Economist and has in 2013 uh, published a very important study, in-depth study, comparative study um, on, on the situation of museums on different continents, in fact. So she is uh, particularly well equipped today to um, uh, make sure that we are <coughs> actually operating and discussing here in a slightly wider context. And I'm handing over to her now, and we'll sit down and become an ordinary panel member. Thank you. Christoph, thank you so much. This is such a perfect setting for a discussion of this kind. Private house, <coughs> private collection built up with passion, with scholarship, bequeathing it to the nation, with one rule, the entry should be free. Now, in the course of doing my special report on museums, I discovered that there are about 55,000 museums throughout the world. <clears throat> Twice as many as there were 20 years ago. So that's been an incredible increase. In the Gulf, we're about to see the opening of a real wave of national museums, including the first universal museum in the Arab world. In China, they open a new museum every single day, if not two. So, Museums really are going through the golden age. Now, our first speaker tonight, <coughs> Robert Hewison, um, is a very well-known cultural commentator in Britain. He's written about the arts for the Sunday Times for 35 years. Sorry, Robert, I had to say that. Um, <coughs> at the same time, he's written books about 19th and 20th century culture in Britain, more than 20 books. And the latest of these is on the cultural politics of 1997 to 2012. The beginning of that period really was Britain's new golden age for museums. And what is going to happen now in the next five years has to be set against that background. His book is called Cultural Capital, The Rise and Fall of Creative Britain. Christoph Wogter, our host, needs no introduction. He's been the director of the Wallace Collection <coughs> since October 2011. And his curatorial speciality is 18th century French painting. We have been the beneficiaries of his knowledge because of his exhibitions on Chardin, on Papier, and the patronage of the Ru Prussian royal house, as well as his catalogue resume on Watteau. Before he came to London, though, Christophe worked in Potsdam, and in Berlin. Given the value that Germany ascribes to culture, and particularly to culture as provided by the state, Christoph brings tonight a very particular and important perspective to this debate. Maria Balshaw is the director of the Whitworth Art Gallery, part of the University of Manchester and the Manchester City Galleries. Renewal and renovation, Maria, has been a hugely long part of the Whitworth's history. The mezzanine court for sculpture, which opened in 2010, was a huge architectural success and quickly became one of Manchester's most visited attractions. But the refurbishment of the main gallery last month has been absolutely phenomenal. In just 19 days, they have had over 60,000 visitors. David Anderson began as an education officer at the Royal Pavilion at Brighton. From there he went to the National Maritime Museum at Greenwich and then to the V&A where he developed the Sackler Centre 
and he helped found the Exhibition Road Cultural Group, a consortium of 17 cultural and educational institutions and two local authorities in London. That was a crucial experience for David and it has helped make him one of the country's chief links between the museum world and the government. For the past two years, David has been president of the Museums Association. He's about to step down from that role in just two or three weeks' time. So tonight he's here speaking with his main flag, I think we could say, as Director General of the National Museum of Wales, particularly to offer us Londoners a crucial viewpoint, which we all too often lose sight of, and that is the, the view from outside the metropolis. Our four panellists are going to each speak in turn, talking about a um, particular aspect of this debate, and then we will open the floor up to questions. We've got roving mics. I'll tell you a little bit more about how we're going to do that. So we're ready. Robert, thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. I'm not using a mic. I think you can hear me at the back. Is that correct? You can. You're nodding. Excellent. And can you see me? Otherwise, I threaten you with standing up. <coughs> I do have trousers on. Um, when uh, our host tonight, uh, Christoph, and I met to discuss the idea of having this debate, yes, the idea of 2020 came up because we thought, uh, well, we should have a vision of some kind. So we thought, well, 2020 vision would be rather a nice way of putting things. So what I'm going to do now is to look forward into my crystal ball and make a few predictions. So in 2020, the director of a national museum will be complaining that there are far too many visitors to his museum. Staff at another national museum will be out on strike in protest at the outsourcing of their duties. Another national museum will be shutting down its scholarly publications department because it's too expensive to run. Another will start charging for access to its archives. Another will face public protests about its choice of commercial sponsors. In the regions, several local authority museums uh, uh, funded by local authorities will close. Many others will have their hours curtailed and several independent museums will suffer the same fate. Having been forced by its local authority to sell a valuable work in order to raise funds from its collection, a local authority museum will lose its accreditation with the Arts Council. And meanwhile, back in London, the trustees of a national museum will be earnestly discussing amongst themselves whether or not to reintroduce charging. Now, if those predictions seem a little familiar, it's because, in fact, all those things have already happened <coughs> or are about to happen. And whoever gets into government in May, the prospects are that the conditions which brought these developments about are going to get worse. It is, in fact, true that the museum sector has been remarkably resilient in the face of the austerity measures imposed by the present coalition government. And while grant and aid from the Department for Culture to national museums and galleries fell by 7% in cash terms, it sounds worse if you put them in, in, in real terms, 7% in cash terms between 2009 and 2014, their overall income actually rose by 18.8%. The turnover of independent museums also rose. And by contrast, and I think this is where the real damage is being done, the income of local authority funded museums has fallen by five million pounds. Looking ahead, we can expect further cuts to DCMS funding for national museums and galleries and through the Arts Council. 
As you know, local authorities have no statutory obligation to fund museums. And the Local Government Association predicts that by 2020, the money that local authorities will have available for all their non-statutory services will have fallen by 66%. Local authority museums are, in the main, hanging on, but by their fingernails. So the outlook is bleak, leading to the changes that I've already described, as well as staff cuts, restrictions on activity, postponement of capital projects, inability to make fresh acquisitions, and an ever-mounting pressure to commercialise the operation. Now, while our major national and regional museums will survive, and I'm delighted to say in the case of Manchester here, thrive, the frostbite that is already beginning to afflict the extremities of the sector, the small local authority museums, will lead to a contraction towards the centre. And that will only increase the general cultural imbalance, I think, between the metropolis and the regions. What we're seeing, as I argue in my book, Cultural Capital, is a contraction of the whole public realm. Now, the public realm is a physical space. It is here. It is the Wallace Collection and all the other public buildings that constitute a cultural infrastructure that has been built up over hundreds of years. But the public realm is also a mental space. It's the collective memory that museums such as the Wallace represent. It's the educational value they offer. It's the aesthetic and social pleasure that a visit can give. The public realm is contracting in terms of the physical space that it can make freely available to those who would enjoy it, and it is contracting mentally as commercial imperatives and neoliberal values fragment the idea of a shared space in which access is free and that does not have to be monetized. If museums are to survive and then to reverse the slow process of attrition that the whole of the cultural sector is currently experiencing, then they have to reassert their value as a fundamental part of the architecture of the public realm. This is a case that they must make to government, which is supposed, after all, to be the guarantor of the public realm, but they also have to rethink and remake their relation with the public, the publics, that they are created to serve. The recent Warwick Commission report Enriching Britain boldly states that one of the country's most visible and admired policies to promote cultural access, free entry to national museums and galleries, has, and I'm quoting, failed in its declared mission to make Britain's flagship museums more inclusive. The government's regular audience <coughs> survey taking part shows the relative lack of participation by black and minority ethnic groups and of the socially disadvantaged. The DCMS-funded museums, the higher social groups accounted for 87% of all museum visits, the lower social groups for only 13%. Now, of course, this is not something I think that the museums can solve on their own. It's a matter of effecting a long-term change through cultural education, something that the current government wants to kill off, as far as I can see. But museums have their own part to play, through the attitude they have towards their publics, through reinforcing the social and educational offer that they make, by rebalancing the distribution of what is available through active partnerships across the country. The public must be encouraged to become co-creators and co-protectors of the public realm. Now, one suggested solution to this crisis, the reintroduction of charging, is not an answer. 
nor do I believe is charging for overseas visitors. To make that discrimination will be to destroy precisely the value that our museums represent. They are a shared space and a collective creation. They are our common memory and our mutual identity. So to rework the title of this discussion, because museums help to conserve our past, they also help to contribute to our future. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, I want to make three points. And um, <clears throat> from uh, the perspective of a national museum, and that means in the present situation, as Robert has already described, from a rather privileged um, position. Um, we are uh, subject to very severe cuts, we think, um, but, we are obviously, but they are obviously um, not quite as severe as one compares them with um, regional museums in particular. And also um, we have the advantage of um, being situated in London and um, having um, contacts with the, <coughs> the um, uh, London philanthropists who are not necessarily as closely associated with museums further away from the capital. My first point is uh, actually uh, just a simple statement about the um, degree of the um, cuts and the transformations we are in right now. Um, we have uh, all tried in the sector to be um, successful and to look successful over the last few years. And that might have been a mixed blessing because um, some of the problems uh, virtually didn't leak into the wider public. What I think um, we will see um, uh, if the cuts continue um, are a couple of um, highly worrying developments. And just to give you um, a sense of the scale, in the case of the Wallace Collection, actually in the last five years, our grant and aid has been cut by almost 40%, so for zero. Um, so that is quite a substantial um, part of the money that comes in. Um, the first tendency um, I see is that we are risking the high quality of museum work in Britain um, because that is um, <coughs> at least to, uh, in part very much based on a functioning and um, up-to-date infrastructure and on uh, extensive knowledge that is in-house and that is actually also passed on in-house and not just bought in for specific projects. The second one is the um, risk to um, scholarly quality and an impartiality because with um, a more dependency on uh, outside funding it's obviously more difficult to say no and also to keep one's own idea of a subject uh, on track um, as it, um, <coughs> and, and that's the situation we are all facing. Um, and finally, um, access opportunities for the wider society and for many communities are being seriously limited. We have um, grant plans here of um, uh, further activities uh, in the access um, arena and uh, in fact we have to cut down almost all of them for the coming years simply because they also cost some money, not just ideas. That's the first point. That's a um, slightly um, depressing statement probably. Um, the second one is uh, something where a discussion might be quite helpful because what we see right now, and that has actually accelerated over the last few weeks, is actually um, a, a strong movement um, towards uh, privatization and a new model for museums and also for national museums in um, Britain. Just two weeks ago, um, the new English Heritage was uh, launched and that is, I think, the first test run of what we are all be faced with. Um, of a um, privatized, uh, of a privatization of a public entity um, with an um, endowment type um, payoff at the beginning uh, and then um, the uh, guarantee that no further regular um, state money will come in. And in fact, um, <coughs> uh, today I received a letter from the DCMS where one sentence says DCMS will work with a number of ALBs, that's arm length bodies, to explore financing models that are less reliant upon grant and aid is exactly that. Um, <clears throat> this is um, a model that might actually work for certain institutions. It's not necessarily wrong to discuss that, but it works, as one can see in America in particular, for very powerful um, organizations and for very um, large uh, organizations with a wide and uh, very reliant donor base. Um, and for um, many <clears throat> small institutions, it might have a negative effect on quality and independence and actually on the scale of activities. And finally, my third point is actually that um, we have seen um, over the years um, uh, a gradual 
um, movement away from uh, actually being honest about what the purpose of museums might be. Um, in the last, uh, in the communication with the um, government over the last two years, there are two areas where um, we are um, encouraged to be active, and one is actually um, the income generation, and the second one is um, tourism, and then the incoming tourism. And I've checked that again last week. Um, <coughs> Uh, I actually haven't read the word art in any letter from the DCMS for um, since I started my job, actually, in fact, so that has not been mentioned again. Um, today I have received a form that um, asks us to uh, provide information that will be used within DCMS's overall spending review narrative to defend public funding. And what we are uh, meant to provide is, um, um, is arguments for our economic benefits, our social benefits, for our support of the UK brand, and for value for money evidence. So again, there's, um, I find there's a very um, considerable gap in that um, narrative, because I would actually like to start that uh, document talking about our collection, the fact um, that this might actually cause pleasure to visitors, or understanding, or something like that, or that um, a meeting between the public and the arts might actually be a very productive experience for both sides. Um, so um, I think we have to remember that museums are very important for cultural literacy. They are important uh, as uh, um, a gateway uh, for access to beauty and creativity. And um, they also help uh, in the political arena because um, somebody who can analyze works of art um, has a much better understanding of history propaganda and also of how PR works, which is something <coughs> that is quite important these days. And um, I would probably, um, I would like to close so just saying that I would still see um, museums as crucial for the um, health of a society and for the well-being of its citizens. And that is uh, something I think we have to um, increasingly bring back into the situation um, um, away from um, the type of letters I keep receiving. Thank you. Christoph, thank you very much. Um, mine is actually remembering when um, the German culture minister came to open um, the exhibition at the Bush Museum. We were told he was a person who could not only give a speech in fluent English here, but who still teaches one session of art history a week. So maybe we should borrow her. Maria, well, yeah, you've come fresh from Manchester when we were doing it. Yeah. With I suspect a very different view on this. Um, a different perspective, at least, on um, similar challenges and issues. I've got wishes, Robert, rather than a crystal ball. And so what I wish for, for my own and other institutions, is that museums should be enjoyable. They should be curious, places of beauty and wonder. They should be sociable spaces that quietly and importantly undo social hierarchy and inequality. And I set out that positive vision against the backdrop of all of these cuts because, as Erica, Robert's wife, in PR, often says, it's extremely hard to motivate people, <coughs> never mind politicians, around a negative campaign. So we're about to go off a cliff. It's all going to hell in a handcart. This is the worst crisis that museums have ever felt. May well be the truth of the economic situation that we find ourselves in. I'm not entirely sure it's the best route out of that situation or the best way to take people with us. My own institutions have experienced year-on-year -year cuts just as Christophe describes. Over the last five years, the Manchester Art Gallery has received 50% less funding over, those, over that five-year period. We are, however, twice as busy. The Whitworth has just reopened and we've had 70,000 visitors now because it's been another three days since I last spoke to Fiametta. Um, and the other two organisations, the Manchester Museum and the Manchester Art Gallery, have also seen a 20% increase in their visitors over that opening period. So there's been a kind of bounce. People are loving museums and galleries in Manchester at the moment. So it would be disingenuous for me to suggest that my institutions are in danger of collapse. And in my city, at least, it's simply not true to say 
that museums and galleries are undervalued. In fact, I find the opposite to be true. The Whitworth hosted the Manchester Leaders Forum last Tuesday. It's a group that will set the 10-year strategy for the city. I listened to leaders in health and social care, education, housing and regeneration, all talking about the importance of museums and galleries for the economic and social future of Manchester as the thing that they can see will make a difference to the wealth and health of the city. So I feel we've rarely been better understood for the richness of our contribution, from the aesthetic to the emotional to the social and the educational. And the remarkable thing is this isn't just Manchester, even as difficult as things are. So out of extraordinary adversity in the selling of an artwork, Bury is transformed some of its museum spaces. In Southport, the Atkinson is expanded, reopened, and doing what its very small local authority wants to happen. As a local authority museum director and a university museum director, I'm well aware that the cuts that are being administered across the public sector are having an impact but not just on museums and galleries. In Manchester, youth provision, care of the elderly, children's services, social care, bin collecting and housing have all been cut. And in truth, they have been cut harder than museums and galleries. And perhaps that's because the city does want to maintain free provision to its museums and galleries, because it sees it as part of the civic pact with its citizens that goes right back to the 19th century. But I think we have been relatively protected because the city also understands that museums and galleries are something that we need now more than ever. I honestly feel that I couldn't lock my colleagues in children's services or adult social care in the face if I wasn't experiencing some cuts. And so what I want to call for is making common political cause within the run-up to the election, and Robert's right that it's a critical moment. I want to make common cause with everyone who believes that public sector funding cuts have gone far enough and are in danger of undoing the social fabric of the country that we live in. Museums are part of that, but they aren't the only part that's being targeted. What I would also like to see are much better arguments being made about how we contribute to the main challenges facing our society in the context of this massively reduced level of public state support. Combating social isolation, supporting physical and mental well-being, broader-based creative education, both things that Robert and Christoph have pointed to, these are all things that museums are rather better placed than others to do and will often deliver them much more cheaply. My colleague and husband, Nick Merriman, who runs the Manchester Museum, gave me a really useful bit of research last week, which demonstrated the cost of treating an 82-year-old man with depression medically was twice that of supporting him to have an active programme of attending his local museum. And the museum visiting was seen to be more effective. So I think we ought to be lobbying for the absolute value of the things that we do intrinsically rather than their instrumental value. Because the long-term problems of our ages are the emotional and social challenges, which, as Christoph points out, is exactly what art is about. So I wouldn't wish to deny the tough economic climate we're in, but I don't want to look back to a golden age either. When I was growing up, no one took me to museums and I didn't choose to go to them myself because I assumed they were only for people <coughs> that were much posher than I was. I see that changed, mostly, across our sector, and it's a very good thing. And there is much more to do. But the challenge I see in the future is not only to hang on to our funding, but to continue the work to make our institutions more culturally democratic and really make the case for why public money invested in museums makes a difference. Maria, thank you. That's certainly an inspiration to us all. I mean, I think all three panels, panelists were talking about a very, very, very fundamental question, which is what 
are our real values. <coughs> David, you come from a part of the country that has some of the poorest towns and villages that exist in Britain. But it also has some of the most incredible collections that have ever been put together here. When you leave London and you go back to that place, what are your thoughts about the values that we should want? Thank you for the question. Um, shall, I, shall I stand? I'd like to start by saying that I, I broadly agree with everything that um, the other panellists have said. And I have to say that, I mean, having worked in London National Museums, plural, for 25 years, my credentials as a representative of... Um, of Wales are probably a little bit limited, really, but nevertheless, it, it's taught me a lot, and maybe I can I can share some of that. If 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 I was to be allowed to um, crystal ball gaze or um, project forwards or in some other way imagine um, the 2020 that we should have, perhaps, then it would be one where museums are radically committed to participative approaches to working with the public um, and that those methodologies are based on deep research of the kind which is already emerging and Maria has indicated I think that over maybe the last five or ten years our <coughs> understanding of the impacts and ways of engagement that museums can successfully achieve has gone forward by, by leaps and bounds and we need to do much more of that. So in 2020, I would hope that that has become so deeply embedded in the sector and so deeply embedded in individual institutions that the quality of, of participation, the effectiveness of co-production, which we know from research, has now been translated into active practice everywhere beyond question. Mm -hmm. That museums would be working much more effectively with third sector organisations to develop their social value that, again, has been, been talked about there, their work with schools, but also informal family community learning, the development of skills through volunteering and apprenticeships, um, the, the supporting of, of community cohesion and sense of identity um, at a time when less and less that is around us can be identified as being locally generated and locally supported, really. Um, the extremes of Clone Town Britain, which the New Economics Foundation, for example, has talked about. And also that, in varying degrees, the, the economic contribution that the museum sector can make to communities through supporting enterprise, through tourism, and crucially also by being centres of creativity and therefore um, connected to the development of a creative economy, something, again, that we are very powerfully able to do and the Warwick Commission has, has highlighted, that we are some integration of public good, um, but also supporting... Um, private return. I think it is important that we understand that um, the investment in the apparently non-economically generating arts and cultural sector um, is nevertheless vitally connected over long periods of time to some of these other areas of, of, um, of creative value. And you just need to look at the um, West Glamorgan Youth Theatre, for example, which has been a generating house of national and international significance, you know, from the Anthony Hopkins to the Michael Sheens, of people who've gone on to really be um, global um, sort of, um, sort of uh, achievers, really, um, in the arts. But they themselves would say that without the West Glamorgan Youth Theatre, they could never have done what they've done. And if that, if that sounds like um, utopianism, then I would argue that all of the things that I have been describing are also present in, in what we see around us now, rather like Robert, um, perhaps with um, complementary examples. It's all here now. It's not as if that has to be invented. It's to be found, if you like. It's to be treasured and valued and built upon. But we do need to say that the problems really are severe. I understand the tactical value of what Maria is suggesting, but I don't think it's, it's enough to be silent about the problems that are being faced at the moment. And what we need is a nuanced debate that, that is both about the, the positive achievements of cities like Manchester and others, 
but also acknowledges that there are many communities and many towns that simply do not have the resource from any area whatsoever to be able to continue to sustain their, um, their cultural activities. And they are, they are gradually disappearing um, in those places. And it's happening now. It's not even a matter of sustaining things as they are at the present. Already a huge amount of damage has been done. Why is it that we have been, as a sector, relatively silent? Where has our voice come from? Who, who can speak for us? And this time now is a time of the test of values for us as professionals, for those who fund us, um, and also, let us say it very clearly, for government too. <coughs> Austerity is killing many local museums. The values of neoliberalism, the values of austerity, are ones which ultimately place no high value on the past, and frankly, no high value on the future. They place no high value on place, on the sense of place, on communities. And the neoliberal ideology allows things to appear and disappear before our eyes, with little chance to control the consequences. And it's no wonder then that the cultural sector is feeling the, the consequences of neoliberalism when so much else in our society is doing so as well. But it also means that we, the cultural sector, are crucial as anchor organisations to help to sustain some sense of local identity and local opportunity when so many other things are being, being sandstormed away. We have a risk that in five years' time, much of the locally funded, the local publicly funded facilities for culture, and we, we are part of the cultural sector, we can't isolate ourselves as being separate from the arts or separate from other bits of it, we are part of all this, we'll have shrunk dramatically. I'm not quite sure whether the figures Robert was giving are those in, in money terms or in real value terms. Um, either way, two-thirds of the funding having gone in five years' time is dire. And over the last year, we have begun to find voices, influential voices, from outside the sector coming forward and saying that there must be change. The Select Committee on the Effectiveness of the Arts Council, for example, the most wide-ranging review of its work, arguably for 30 years, the report, of, the report of the Core Cities Group, which has identified <coughs> culture as being of crucial importance for the, the success of, of cities. The Science and, and Technology Select Committee, which looked at the, the, uh, the future of Kew Gardens and its funding, and described the current government strategy, funding strategy for this, as a recipe for failure, in, in the words of its chair. Um, we are identifying already, as we've heard, that museums reach demographics which do not reflect the population to varying degrees. Now, I have to say, we have to be careful about generalised statements here. Um, that's, that we are failing to reach those demographics may be true for many museums, but for many other museums it's not true. Um, and, for example, Liverpool, for instance, has a very high representation of it, National Museums Liverpool, with its, um, of its uh, socio-economic um, profile of its population. Um, and National Museum Wales likewise, not as much as we should be, but nevertheless very much greater than has been described for other institutions. We have the challenge that 70% of private funding for museums goes to London, um, and we need to be aware that funding London is not to fund the UK. And this is an issue for government every bit as much as for private sector funding. funding. And the consequences of this are that talent in the regions does not get the opportunity to be expressed. It is not a solution for national museums in London, or come to that, the National Museum in Cardiff, to pulse out exhibitions to uh, diminished, shriven um, little local museums, which then have no opportunity for their own staff to develop their creative potential. All the creative opportunity still lies then at the centre. Now, in Wales, there have already been steps to face up to these issues. Um, there is a review of local museums going on at the moment, chaired by Dr Hayden Edwards. And 
That review, I am quite certain, will be looking at the role not just of the local museums but also the National Museum of Wales um, and the government agency, come all, that is responsible for the museum sector. So we will all be in the frame on this. There has been a report on national relationship between education and culture, Di Smith's report, and with £20 million being put in by the Welsh Government and the Arts Lottery in Wales to sustain a new initiative in this. Major and significant thing. When did we last have a, a systematic nationwide education and cultural initiative aimed at every single school? Well, the Welsh Government's going to have a go at doing it. Um, Kay Andrews' report on culture and poverty. Um, we would never claim as museums to be able to take away poverty. What we can do, very powerfully research suggests, is to challenge the consequences of poverty, to give children life chances, for example, and, and aspirations that they might not otherwise have. The tools are there, um, and some nations are beginning to develop them. What one doesn't have at the moment is any sense that there is a coming together of strategy and policy in England, or even an aspiration to do so. So, there is a need for urgent, an urgent need for additional funding for local and regional museums, not in five years' time, but now. There's a need for devolution of funding decisions in England outside the metropolis. There is a need for a national cultural strategy, not just for museums, although we're part of it, but for culture as a whole, which completely rethinks what our purpose and contribution can be. There is a need, let me say it for the BBC and others, there is a need for the London-based media, media to start to recognise the extent of excellence there is by any standard <coughs> Um, out in the English regions and in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And the BBC is appalling for this, it has to be said. Um, these are not utopian proposals. They should not be dismissed as unrealistic. We need to accept that the cultural model that we have had, the cultural funding model we've had, is failing and is very unlikely to be put back in the same way again. We need to develop new models, new business models, new, new ways of working. We need to look to co-production cultural participation, cultural democracy, a very different relationship with our public. We need to accept that ultimately it is what the public need that should be driving us, not our traditional sense of um, what we are as institutions. We need to realise that the model that was developed in the 19th century and was wonderful then for what a museum is, is no longer completely fit for purpose for the 21st century. We need to have the courage to challenge the present model, to speak about the need for change, and then actually to change it. Um, Josh Spear from Spears Magazine and Tatler. Um, I've got a, a sort of left field question for you. Um, museums presumably have international responsibilities as well. What should British and global museums be doing about the looting of uh, artifacts and destruction of artifacts uh, in areas of conflict? not just ISIS, but around the world at the moment? Well, yeah, I think it'd be better if a museum specialist uh, answered this, but we do have the example of what Neil McGregor has tried to do, and try, the kind of leadership that he's shown through uh, the British Museum and the British Museum's uh, relations with, with Iraq. Um, I think that's an example where, in fact, an institution has actually taken upon itself, as it were, to do something that, uh, well, the government appears to be rather reluctant to engage with. But I would have thought David had a, as particularly, although he's not here as the Museums Association, uh, he would know, you know, what, what the museum's community thinks. Well, I think probably there's a lot of people in the, from the museum's community in the room, and I wouldn't claim to have any more expertise, perhaps, than, um, than those. Um, I think it might help by us actually not selling Sakenko and other objects like that ourselves. Um, we haven't, in that respect, in the last year or two, had a great, a great um, uh, sort of track record of showing that we believe that objects should stay in the public domain too. But um, more, more centrally, I do think that the actions of the British Museum in this area have been um, sort of sector leading, really, and that we, we, prob we probably just have to accept that we have actually really very little power of control over what's happening there. And, um, and I think that what all we can do is to try to ensure that our processes of acquisition and our work in relationships with other countries 
is such as to do everything we can to, um, to discourage and to avoid involvement in, the, in this illicit market that's, that's going on. And I think we have to recognise that London itself is one of the places where quite a lot of illicit trade passes through. So I do think there's a role perhaps for us to be talking more with government about how that could be, could be better stopped. I think there's a wider aspect to this as well, if I can just step in for a moment myself. Um, I think the time has come where we should really think seriously about a different uh, a pattern, a different way of dealing with disputed artifacts. Um, I think that the sort of crude model, if you want, of two institutions or two countries acting like three-year-olds going, it's mine, has to come to an end, that there are um, serious collaborations that can be undertaken to, um, if there's nothing else, to put on exhibitions, international exhibitions that people would see all over the world. Um, I'm thinking particularly of, for example, an exhibition um, in the gifts of the Sultan of which only half was shown in America because the Russians wouldn't lend anything. Half of it was shown here because the Turks wouldn't lend anything. And in the end, the only place that you could see it all together was in Qatar, um, where Turkey, Russia, and everywhere else felt safe enough to be able to send the things that they had. The more exhibitions, the more international exhibitions we want to put on, the more dangerous that conflict is going to be so some sort of mechanism, uh, and there may have been an opening with um, the loan from the British Museum of um, the Parthenon marble to Russia, that may have been a start of it. There has to be a new model for dealing with this disaster. Question for all the panel. Um, day one, after the general election, what was your one ask of the new culture minister be? Ooh, good question. Let's suppose we, we know who the new culture is to be or, or even from which party. Same question, David, what can you tell us? Well, from what I've said already, you might guess this. Um, get a strategy. Yeah. Stop being in denial. No choice. I mean, we, we're desperate for it. Um, the damage just continues as long as there isn't any real framework to operate within. I would uh, symbolically remove the DCMS from its current position at the back side of the treasury. <laughs> Those who don't get the joke, they are actually occupying a kind of small corridor rammed up the back of the treasury. And where would you put it? Well, um, probably as far away from the treasury as possible. Uh, I'll put that up because my first ask would be that they get on a train north. Yes. So perhaps you could relocate it to North Manchester. Yes. No, not Manchester. Manchester's doing far too well in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we can have one of those trains that goes round and round. Good um, question there. Yeah. I, mean, I would also think that my wish would actually um, probably be relevant for a week earlier um, to get um, um, somebody into that position who's actually seriously in love with the arts. Mm -hmm and who actually can uh, provide a voice for us. Um, I, mean, I feel that quite a bit of what we're getting right now where we are uh, encouraged to, to form a voice for us. Um, I mean, if one translates that to the MOD, that would be as if the army is actually explaining to the government why there's an army. I mean, that's, that's roughly what we are doing right now. And I think that would be very helpful to have that already. And then I think, and I think based on that love or passion for the subject, one could actually then um, very well live with very different opinions on what we are meant to do. Isn't one of the problems that, that the museum sector itself is divided against itself? Yeah. There was a proposal uh, at the beginning of the New Labour period that the national museums and the uh, regional museums should all be funded through the same system. But you're not going to give, your trustees are not going to give up their personal uh, social access to, uh, to the DCMS, are they? Well, we could ask some of them. <laughs> I've spotted quite a few in the room. I will not talk for, for them. I mean, I think if, if 
if we all, in fact, had the feeling that there would be um, a redistribution and, uh, and an overall planning that would actually benefit the sector as a whole, I think everybody would seriously consider that and probably still have some objections to make. But um, um, I think that would be actually, I mean, very much according to what you say, that would not be, um, um, that would be very positive news. And, and, and but isn't that necessarily sort of insider look about it? I mean, here we have yeah. a reality. We have a country which has got the biggest population it's ever had. It's got the most aging population it's ever had. It's got the most socially divided, probably the most socially divided since the 19th century. It is, in many ways, uh, as far as museums are concerned, and you can see it on the ground, racially divided. There's a much, much smaller percentage of people, adults in particular, because children, of course, are brought here by schools, but it's adults from racial minorities that come from museums. It's all very well saying that we want a strategy and saying that we want more money and saying that we want people to believe in museums. But surely the sense of belief and confidence and must do has to come from within museums themselves. So what is it that we can do that are going to make museums places that people want to come to and more importantly want to bring their children to? I'm not convinced that you need a culture minister who loves the arts, actually. I, because that presumes ownership of a, a, a background and an education and a kind of a, a cultural patrimony, and it would usually be patrimony, given to that arts minister. What I think we need are politicians that understand the difference the kind of institutions that we run could make, sometimes do make, and also don't always make. And I, I also, I mean, I thought the word nuanced, that um, you talked about a nuanced debate, David, is really important. I think what the national museums can and should do is quite different to what regional museums can and should do, and also what the independent museum sector does. And a small museum in a village necessarily has a different function than the Wallace Collection. And I'm actually relatively relaxed about the fact that the large national institutions are broadly tourist industries these days. You know, they are in a world city, you know, one of the most culture-rich cities in the world. And so certain conditions govern life in London. And it is quite different if you're operating in Brighton or Bury or Manchester. And what I'm really interested in is people understanding the impact that different institutions can make. And we've got to make that argument whether there's a lot of money or a little bit of money. Because we've lived through the worst recession in anybody's memory, and we will come out of that. But I want to come out of that with a different argument about what museums and galleries do. Because when there is more money, I would like more of it. <laughs> Caroline Campbell from the National Gallery. Um, my question was really responding to something David said about national strategy for museums in the context of a debate for the arts and the figures he came up with from Wales. I was wondering what the panellists would have to say about how we could do this when we're in a country not just of diversity, but of you know, several different nations, not just you know, Wales, but Scotland, Northern Ireland, and also the English regions too. Um, I think in, in terms of the nations which you mentioned, um, the devolution of culture, I think, means that it's inevitable that there will be different models and different responses to nation conditions happening across the UK. So I think my, my first priority would be to try to ensure that each of the four nations has got its act together, really, on this, which to different, different degrees they, they are or are not at the moment. But I, I do think as well that there is a lot that different nations can learn from each other in the ways in which they can operate. And, um, you know, there are some things which are fantastically successful about the London National Museum's models, which I think many of us would aspire to, to do more of. And I think we certainly in National Museums will to do look at what the Science Museum does, what the DNA does and others. I think it would be very healthy if there was also some learning going the other way as well, too. Um, and not to attempt for us to, to, to impose a, a single way of working in museums, either across nations or across the diversity of different types of, um, 
of the museum. I think that there's one more thing perhaps I could just add, which is that there is a, there's an Irish traditional tale about the man who had no story, um, and who sat sitting round the hearth with the others when it came to his turn to tell a story, could not tell a story. He then, I won't give you the full details, but he then by accident fell in among the fairies and had all sorts of misadventures and eventually escaped and came back to the village where he came from. And, but the thing about him was that he then had a story. Now my worry about the museum sector is that we don't quite yet have a story that we all can use and accepting our diversity, accepting everything else that is distinctive about different types of museums that we still haven't got a common story that we can all agree to stand beside. I think it's there potentially for us to take some of the research I mentioned before, I think is some of the foundation of those kind of social impacts, but also as Maria and others have said, you know, the joy, the, the pleasure, the almost indefinable dimensions of museums as well. I think the story is there for us to put together and we can share that across all the nations. Robert, can I ask you, what is the reason for that, do you think? I mean, we knew that Britain is made up of four nations, but that has been the case for centuries. What ties New Zealand together within the four nations is far greater than what divides them. Yes, um, except that from my experience, what experience I've had of working with museums, that museums tend to be very costive, and they tend to be very siloed. I've, I've found dealing with some museums extremely difficult because they have always been concerned with Principally with the object, of course, that's what, that's what they do. It's the object. But because the object is precious, they have tended to become precious themselves. Now, that, that is changing. Um, is it but costive I, I, and isolated? Yes, I, I think so. Yeah, or I, are they conservative? I, well, they're, <laughs> look, they're, they're conservative in, 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 in a conservatorial way, not in a cons politically conservative way. Well, could I come back to actually to the, uh, the question about a national policy which includes the nation? The interesting thing is that we do actually have one agency which is still uh, UK-wide, and that's the Heritage Lottery Fund, um, which, unlike other things, continues to have a, a UK-wide remit, although within that it actually has... Uh, followed a very good model of, of, of devolution of decision taking and so on. And I think that that shows that it, and the, the HLF does have you know, a clear policy and strategy for the use of its money. I, I personally think that what we really need to do is to rethink the sector, including the heritage sector, including the natural heritage, and create something like a, a historic environment agency, which actually had a UK-wide responsibility for bringing these things together so that the sector began to speak with more of one voice. That, of course, is probably far too utopian. Well, Mariah. I another another finder. Or a another super, finder. A super finder. I heard Robert talk about that. Well, look, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the Quanga. You have to have some form of organisation. Yet, Quangos go wrong. We have plenty of organisations. Yes, I know. We have too many. That's what I'm saying. You could have fewer Quangos because you would bring them all together. Personally, I draw the line at the natural environment much as I like walking in it. But you what see, I here's a silo. A silo coming up. What I think is really useful in looking at the Heritage Lottery Fund example, and it, it isn't only because of the very generous support they've recently given to the Whitworth. One of the things that we found most useful in working with them is the clarity around their objectives. And it is look after the old stuff and make sure more and different kinds of people see it. And if you can do both of those things, then you really are doing a bloody good job as a 21st century museum. Because all the time, it's, I do not like it when we tip towards that it is all about the people and it's only about the people. Actually, I'm not absolutely convinced that the public, whoever that is, know exactly what they want when they come into a museum. I think quite often they don't know what they want and they'd like to find something they didn't know about at all. But I have no track at all with the, it's all about the precious objects and the paintings just need to be there for time and forever. Most it's most about the two, it's about the, how, we, how we gauge that balance. Most people will think of the Heritage Lottery Fund as something which is 
expressly involved with Tati Project, which is a very, very easy, cut off, <coughs> very neat way to do it. Are you saying that they offered you more than that? Because if they did, that's incredibly well, welcome. They do, um, because they concern themselves with the activities that go on in the buildings that they help. And, and these days, their, their money only comes to you if you can demonstrate what you were going to do. But so for me, got halfway to what Robert wants. He wants to sort of take the left two. But it's also more about the simplicity of an argument. You know, mm -hmm. that they, they're quite straightforward about what they want to happen. Yeah. It is also the case that the coalition is driving a coach and horses through the actual additionality rules to do with the to do with the, the lottery they are basically i mean one of perhaps the only good things that you come out of is the fact that the heritage lottery fund i'm afraid to say is going to become the, the only funder unfortunately it is quite a coherent organization or so it appears to be uh, in spite <coughs> of its love of paperwork um, so we have an example there of what could be achieved but we also have to be aware that, that the, the coalition is looking, is simply using the heritage as a, as, a, as a way of replacing what should be funding by the state for what the state believes to be important for its people. Powell talked a lot about the cuts to the cultural sector and the problems that museums face. I was just wondering if the panel views any possibility in a partnership with uh, institutions of other art sectors like uh, dance or theatre, and if so, how they envisage this? Well, there's certainly a number of, I don't know whether you do it here at the Wallace, but there's certainly a number of museums, Tate Modern being the, probably the chief example, where you have all sorts of um, forms, art forms, are put on at the same time. Mm -hmm. Maria, you probably have um, more experience. I mean, in, mm -hmm. in my own institutions, and many that I know, we work very regularly with other art forms and arts organisations. And I suppose for me, the even larger opportunity at the moment is that this is an argument that needs, the argument about the value of public investment in culture is one that needs articulating across all art forms. And, and actually we don't stand in any different position than people that work in the <coughs> orchestra sector or in the theatre sector. You know, which bit of the cultural sector isn't feeling the current pressure on the public purse. And, and so I think the more common cause that we can make, the better, really. At the moment, there seems to be a huge... Uh, uh, and uh, enthusiasm for museum studies and further education involving learning greater skills around museums. And the higher education sector seems to be doing very well out of this because I mean, there's a degree course so which need to be privately funded. Do you think there is uh, anything that can be done by the sector to try and work more closely, more quick, quickly with higher education institutions to help museums benefit from this of this resource of talent and enthusiasm and funds? that must be there, because otherwise the, the university hosting these courses wouldn't be able to survive. I think certainly in principle there must be. I mean, in China they talk about building new museums, they talk about the hardware. They have the hardware now, they've got museums, they don't have the software, they don't have either the content, or much more importantly, they don't have the people at all. At least we are sort of half the way there. David, what do you see in, um, uh, not just in Wales, but just for a moment with your Museums Association hat on, um, you have had a, a, some national experience of this. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think it's a changing picture, and of course it varies, again, where one, where one sits, but um, certainly what we're finding in Wales is that the universities are now immensely keen to work with the museum sector and actually the other art sectors for a very practical reason, which is that impacts are, are, are key now to their assessments and, um, and they're getting successful research bids. So very utilitarian reason, but nevertheless it does mean that there is a much more extensive dialogue that I think many museums are having now with higher education, maybe in the case even five or ten years ago. But I, I, sort of picking up on your wider point really, 
Um, I think there is a really significant potential coming together about partnership in public space, thinking again about Exhibition Road, and the ways in which higher education can benefit from the role that museums have in public space. And for example, um, Royal, College of Art, Royal College of Art was very interested in working with the VA when I was working there, um, in order that their students should be able to work with the public. We were a sort of ready-made platform for public engagement for their students to test out design ideas and to get feedback from members of the public as they do. And, and the whole public space of Exhibition Road was in a sense uh, um, a gallery space, a performance space, and many other things. So I think there's many levels to potential collaboration on this. I'm passionate about the ability of museums to combat social inequality. I think we all pride ourselves on that. But what frustrates me is that sometimes museums don't start at home. And museum workforces tend to be very hierarchical. They're not very diverse. And with such poor salaries and so many unpaid internships as we see, I can't see how that's going to change, but I wonder whether the panel had thoughts about perhaps policies they're implementing or things they'd like to see that might uh, encourage a more, a more diverse and equal workforce in museums. I mean, I find this one of the most worrying aspects, actually, of the situation we are in, uh, and that is the, um, um, an act that we are limited in the active development of staff uh, at the museum in many ways, actually. And also that we are in the great danger of losing um, a lot of essential knowledge that is in the museums because we can only offer that much right now. I mean, we had uh, <coughs> um, more than two years of um, pay freeze here, and uh, we're still um, below inflation in what we offer here for the, uh, for the staff, which means in real term over the last um, six years, the uh, salary has actually fallen quite dramatically, and we had a first example of a gallery staff member who said he simply can't afford to come to work, so he has to stay at home because that's the better deal for him. Yeah? Um, so I think that's that's the degree we are we are we are talking about there. Um, so um, I think what we can only we can only do a little bit of fine tuning, which is and and we all know that this is not enough, and this is actually not tackling the real quest, the real problem behind that. Yeah? So um, we have tried in the last. Over the last um, few years, I mean, in the German system I come from, there's a, <coughs> um, a type of position that's called volunteer, which is actually not a volunteer at all, but it's an entry-level curatorial position that runs over two or three years. And it's clear from the beginning it's a training position for curators, and then afterwards they are um, hopefully prepared to get a full curatorship at the museum. So we've introduced that type of position in the curatorial department and the conservation department, just to um, do a little bit of opening up. But I'm afraid um, many more productive plans we have, I just simply don't know how to implement right now. So um, it's, it's really, it scratches the surface. And, and I agree with your description, 110%. Um, but I feel um, right now, I mean, uh, I think one of the problems of the, of the financial situation is that if, if one gets easily pushed into the corner that guarding the status quo is the greatest success one can imagine, and I think that's why, why your um, um, voice was so important to say, no, this is actually not what we should be doing. Yeah? We, should be, we should be changing and we should come out on the other end in a, in, in a better shape. Yeah? But um, I, think that, I find that's that what makes it really difficult right now to, to keep the, the optimism and the openness running and, and, and think about um, a change in staffing and structure that's actually also not seen as a threat to, um, to the staff because every single time one talks about restructuring right now that actually is immediately translated into redundancies for actually for realistic reasons. Yeah. So um, there, there's, there's really limited scope for that. Um, I think the picture is quite different wherever you are in the country. And actually I think the most acute challenges around employment and, and staff are in London because it's so expensive to live here. And so Curatorial salaries or education staff salaries or visitor team salaries are terrible in London. They are less bad in the north of England. They are living wages most definitely there and housing is also more affordable. And so the challenge across the north, or certainly in Manchester at least, is about introducing different modes of recruitment and different kinds of structures so that we start to diversify the workforce much more quickly because it hasn't changed, it, it, it doesn't, we are much less diverse as staff than we are in our visitor numbers. And, and that can't go on. 
And I've seen some really good examples. Yeah, absolutely. But I've seen really, really good examples where we um, have completely changed how we, we take entry-level staff into the institutions and go through kind of open calls out to our local schools and communities and <coughs> higher education and further education providers <coughs> instead of assuming, and um, no disrespect at all to the Museums Journal, which does a very good job online, but not assuming that all of our staff will come through an advert in the Museums Journal because that isn't going to diversify the workforce quickly enough. The, the other really positive change that I, I see across local authority institutions and university institutions is that the positions for women are much better supported than they ever used to be. It is really viable to have children and maintain a career path these days, and it wasn't when I started my career. And that's something that is possible within a local authority structure where actually the thinking is much more progressive about job shares and part-time working and different hours. And so there are things that we can learn by, by looking at the different elements of our sector. What about in the Muslim community where would museums be seen as uh, an acceptable place for young Muslim women to go and work? I don't feel I have enough knowledge to answer that question properly, but, but I know from work that we've done in our, my own institutions that museums are seen as safe places for young Muslim women to visit. With their families. With their families, with their children. And if we keep that up, they will become places where more diverse people wish to work. Um, my name's Henry Schlosser, I'm freelance director of the BBC. Um, I'm obviously speaking from David Anson's work. Um, I, I think that's true. I think that's absolutely true. Um, I think it may be more at an executive level than at a kind of um, uh, my level. Um, I, I think there's a, whatever Tony Hall is director of the BBC might say about um, freedom of the arts, I, I don't see that. I, I have no idea what he means by that. I, mean, I don't see it within the corporation or any of the programmes we actually do. Um, I have, in my experience, um, coming up with ideas for stories or sort of going regularly to openings has had a slight problem, I think, in the, from the museum side about how to pitch a story or how to see a story or how to where the story is. Um, I think that is a problem. Um, I think that quite often the press departments, whether they're internal or external, don't really understand the nature of what we do, whether it's for a cultural affairs programme or if it's for a longer programme. Um, I think it's very difficult. People within the BBC don't understand. Oh, yeah, but how I mean, no, no, no. But then, my, as I was going on, yeah. was the, was <laughs> that, um, then, for example, uh, one that's written in London at the moment, and I apologise, it's not the regional um, exhibition, is the Boyer exhibition at Porto, which is an extraordinary exhibition for its, for its uh, bravery, for its scholarship, for its um, execution, and for its sheer detective work. It's a very good story. Um, I would not, and the curators are fantastic. I would love to have done something like that. I would never get that past my executive level because it's drawing, so that means it's less interesting. Their black and white drawing is really very uninteresting. Probably haven't heard of Boyer. Probably, is that a restaurant in Brimstone? Probably that's what they think. Dead white and, line, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, and then maybe the dead white man issue, which, is, which you know, isn't easy. Um, and yet, it's a damn good story. And I suppose what I want to ask is, um, and I can think of lots of things, I mean, at the Watts Gallery, of uh, recently with some petition at the Ashford Union Arts, so it's all good, select forward stories. What, what would you expect from the BBC? How, in a way, does the BBC and, and serve you better? I mean, I don't know if they do it on regional television more than they do it on national television. I don't know. But, I mean, I do feel that Lee Fullen is the tramp of the BBC of only doing the blockbusters. The only show I've seen covered recently in London, where I've done many shows, is Will Gompert's doing his usual shtick at the Impressionist thing in, in, in the National Gallery. Great show, no disrespect, but that's the inevitable one they do, and there are many more interesting shows than that, the Goya, for example. Same or the photography exhibition of Tate. Huge area, this, which we can barely touch on. Um, the reality is that there is no art centre of excellence in Wales for the BBC. The one in Scotland, the one in London, there's not one in Wales. Um, the BBC call it a no. Not at all. So immediately we don't have a voice, either within Wales or to get to the network. Um, 
everybody, whether they're producers, even BBC Wales staff themselves internally, say it's all but impossible for Wales to get art stories onto network BBC. Um, art is Mundi, which is um, an exhibition, an international contemporary art competition and exhibition, been running for 12 years now, um, had never once even had somebody from the arts team of BBC come down to Cardiff to see it, let alone cover it, until the clamour from the national press in London about the superior quality of that exhibition to the Turner Prize finally forced BBC to send Will Gompertz down to cover it. It is a nightmare, actually, to be blunt, and it goes endemically into the whole core of how the BBC operates, and it needs fundamental change. It really does. And the consequence of it is we find it much harder to get funding from sponsors and others because we can't get the media coverage, not just the BBC, but also very often from the uh, London media full stop. Um, you know, there isn't time to talk about it really, but that's a start. I did stick up for one of, my co one of your colleagues, actually. John T. Claypole, as Director of Arts, is trying to tackle this. So there is work ongoing about trying to establish a, a kind of arts lead in every one of the English regions, as well as in Scotland and Wales. And um, I think there is the beginnings of awareness. Because I've been lobbying, exactly as you have, David, for, for more coverage of, across the northern regions. But I am seeing a shift. And there has been... I mean. Again, Manchester's had an embarrassing amount of coverage over the last um, number of months. But it is about having that expertise in each of the regions, and that's what's going to be critical. Let, let me ask you all about a separate thing. I, I sit on the board of the Edinburgh Book Festival, and for the first time this year, we're not going to have a media partner. Um, long story to do with God and trying to do it, but there is a feeling that actually the moment, this, this long period of having media partners is fading away. And the reason for that is because of local social media, local Twitter campaigns, local Facebook campaigns. No longer is it, and this is as much for magazines as it is for exhibitions or anything else, no longer is it possible just to put them on and expect the public to come. You have to put things on and then you have to take them out to them. You don't necessarily need the mainstream media to do that. But it's a fraction of the network audience, social media. I'm sorry, I mean, the BBC is Twitter of text, but I mean, really, it's, it's so much... It's less. only at the beginning. That's what they all say, but you still get more viewers on television and radio than you get from Twitter or, or, or Facebook. I mean, you know, I think that's a very long-term thing. Mm, not just Facebook. I think <coughs> <coughs> well, there's one, one cheerful footnote. Uh, that is, in fact, the BBC's current affairs programme, The World Tonight, um, is actually featuring this discussion tonight. So, uh, and there is a kind of mini rerun of some of the discussions uh, that we've had during, during this evening. So, rush back, and you can hear the whole thing <laughs> only quicker and possibly better expressed. But uh, it does show that. Actually, and this, this, this is why, I, again, I'm not a museum professional, but I want to congratulate uh, 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 Christoph for actually raising this issue, getting people together, and gradually, I think, that, and there are other organizations which are, as it were, being linked into this, this particular debate, which we've started probably far too late, but at least it's been started, and... Parche, your, your, your complaints, the BBC even has picked up on it tonight. Radio. <laughs> 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 nothing, there's nothing wrong with radio. No, no, I love radio. It's my personal TV. I'm from Radio Current Affairs and we make foreign affairs documentaries other current affairs. I'm just doing it as a person of interest. I've never heard of maybe coming in the media or Christmas board and that might be commissioned. Do you have a Thank you. 
Well, mine's a very, very personal one. My father suffered three strokes in the last 18 months, and um, the best care that I have seen for him and other people um, who are uh, older and uh, dealing with the consequences of stroke is the work that the Whitworth, the Manchester Camerata and the Royal Exchange has developed together around how the arts, just experiencing the arts, aids stroke recovery. And that our health partners think that's the best way of tackling that really difficult problem, but it's a human story about how the arts helps us. I think the story is that our national culture is in danger of ending up on our national hospital trolley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if I could offer one as well, and I'm fully endorsing my suggestion to both those two. Um, I also think that the international dimension of this is significant. I mean, we're hearing about China, about other countries, and how they deal with, um, with culture, and how they're investing massively in it. And what's happening in China is mind-blowing and the scale of investment there. I think putting us into an international context on this would actually throw up many of the issues that we're, we're discussing tonight. Absolutely, and one of the sort of crucial things about it that we, we forget here is how much knowledge and how much experience we have <coughs> in the of this sector. Exporting what we know and how well we do it to countries that are only beginning to uh, build New Zealand is actually one of the really quiet things that you don't hear about. It's going on all over the